Thank you. When I was 19 years old, my life story made national headlines. 2020, Oprah Winfrey, uh, People Magazine, you name it. And they were covering this radical transformation that I had had in my life. Because see, I was born the child of people who were highly addicted to drugs. I was born with heroin in my system. I you know, I'd lost my parents at a very young age. And after years of truancy, losing my parents to HIV AIDS, I became homeless. I was homeless on the streets of New York City. And what the media was really focusing on was this kind of light bulb moment I had that sent me back to get my education. As a homeless person, I doubled down. I went to high school. I was able to get myself to Harvard University on full scholarship, right? So this was a radical transformation. And today I run an organization that creates positive outcomes for youth. There's even one very cheesy Lifetime movie made about my journey, right? <laughs> But I'm not here today to talk to you about that really uh, so much as something interesting and I believe very valuable that emerged from that experience. For anyone who, if you're like me, if you've dedicated your life to helping kids have positive outcomes, I want to offer to you that is possibly one of the most valuable things that we could be talking about. Because right? here I am in this media storm and I didn't really understand why. Why is the fixation? Because my phone began ringing off the hook. I got letters, emails communication from around the country, and people were asking for me, that homeless to Harvard person, to come out and travel and go to their schools, uh, go to their mentoring programs. I got calls from superintendents. The, it was very consistent. It was adults who were working with kids. I had gone through obstacles. Their kids had obstacles. Could I come help? I didn't know if I could be useful, but I did want to help. I got on a plane, and what unfolded was over a decade of traveling to work between youth and adults. And now I realize that actually what was going on was that I was being called around the country during a time where there are some very important things happening in the backdrop of the way that we perceive learning and thriving and education right, with children. And, and one of them is that the standards are getting higher and higher. Our country is not doing so well on a lot of markers, so we're kind of tightening the screws. And then in order to get kids to rise to the occasion, you see things that are wildly popular like character education. And if you, it's been around for decades. It's more formalized now, but it's very, very simple. It's this idea that if you want kids to be able to rise up, really anyone, there are scientists who dedicate their entire lives to looking at peak performers. So like Olympians, right? gold medal Olympians, or Nobel laureates, people who are peak in their field. Scientists study their habits and their character, right? And then they're going to teach us, based on their habits, you know, how we can all become, right? And so, of course, you know, cue the homeless to Harvard woman. And I come into these schools, right? And imagine how awkward. I'm like holding a microphone in Juneau, Alaska, and the teachers are briefing me. Liz, <laughs> you know, okay, these six kids were involved in a, a housing complex that burned down. They lost their parents. This child has got stage four leukemia and, you know, all sorts of things. Go get them, right? <laughs> you know, like rise to the occasion. And something has always felt deeply misguided, not so much necessarily interaction by interaction. They were beautiful. But in the framework in which we were looking at what really creates resilience and thriving in kids, I'm really excited to be here with you today to talk about what that is, the part that got left out of the story. Because surely I shared it, but really the media did not hold on to this piece. And that piece holds everything. Arthur was a neighbor that was my next door neighbor in my building growing up in the Bronx. Arthur was a longtime family friend, very trusted. He knew my parents were on drugs. He knew things were hard. He had a front row seat. Many nights when there wasn't enough food, Arthur and his girlfriend would cook dinner and bring it down for my, they, I would get to eat with them. And when he saw me watching television, he'd snap it off, take me in the hallway while my parents were getting high, and he would read with me. He would get my homework done. And the way he went about it, Liz, you have to get your homework done. You have to go to school. I mean, you have such important things to do with your life, Liz. Of course we have to get this done. And though I was only maybe 11, he listened to me with such excitement. I mean, you would think I was Aristotle, right? He's like, he would light up. Really what it was is his profound interest in my inner world. I did not have much. We were broke. We didn't have much. But here was this person who would light up like a Christmas tree to learn more of what I had to offer. Right? And slowly over time, I grew to believe that maybe then I was worthy of interest. Maybe I was worthy. Right? And when I was chronically truant and failing, which I really always was, he'd get out the car, and he was going to drive me to school. And man, was he excited to take me to school. At least that's what he let me believe. Right? And on those, those drives, those conversations, you know what it is about you, Liz? 
I see that you have so much to contribute. You have so much in this world. You're going to change a lot of lives, so I've got to get you to school. And by the way, school is awesome, right? And I felt terrible in the classroom. But if Arthur was excited about it, then maybe there was something in it that I just didn't see yet. And a few years later, when he died very suddenly of a heart attack, the same year that I lost my mother, that I became homeless, I was sleeping in these hallways, a dropout, and I had a choice to make about what I was going to do with my life. And the voice that Arthur spoke to me in became the voice I used to speak to myself. Because, hey, I couldn't live like this. I had somewhere to go. I had something to contribute. And if I mattered, then maybe I could never give up. People will grow into the conversations that you create around them. Today, I am the co-founder and executive director of the Arthur Project. We use relationship-based education to create economic and social mobility in the lives of youth. I want to tell you that the relationship that creates the conditions for thriving is the single most overlooked catalyst for transformation in youth. If you see someone, a human being, for what they lack and need to gain because they lack, they will see themselves through a lens of lacking. If you treat someone like they matter, well, belonging will lead to becoming. Other industries have figured this out in areas of our society. It's indispensable. Look at athletics. Look at sports. Sports psychologists, we invest millions of dollars a year. Best equipment, best trained athletes, highest expectations, but we understand that is the relationship between the coach and the athlete that is the performance driver, right? We understand this in, in aviation. Talk about a place where people are working together and need to understand trust, coordination, and collaboration, right, when you're in that seat. We spend millions of dollars a year doing two main things in multiple industries that we've not yet brought to education and learning. And what they are is we distill down the core elements of what makes the relationship function, and we put a system around it to make it reliable. It is time to bring the science of relationship to the forefront of education. This is exactly what we're doing at the Arthur Project, but to be real with you, we don't quite know how yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we just got started. We are only two years old. We are operating out of two schools in the Bronx, and I wanted to go back to where I came from. We are making it happen for these kids and showing very promising results. We do know what the work ahead of us looks like. We, ne we need to answer some big questions. We know that children learn from people they love. How? Why? What are the core qualities? How do we put them into systems, make them reliable, and stop leaving it to chance? You wouldn't send the pilot into the cockpit without coordinating those relationships and making them reliable. You wouldn't send a football player on the field. We cannot continue to send our children into schools without understanding the science of relationship. We cannot take for granted. We have to support our teachers and not just assume that it's baked in. We have to decide the qualities, create them, because whatever you can measure, you can manage. And this is what we absolutely must do for our children. And by the way, <laughs> when you do that, you'll get your algebra, you'll get your attendance, you'll get your grit, <laughs> you'll get all of it. We need to understand, is it a byproduct of the relationship? It is a byproduct because belonging will lead to becoming. So at the Arthur Project, this is what we're committing, committed to doing and spreading far and wide. Come see us and stay tuned. Thank you. Yeah.